So good afternoon, Dr. Burke, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Burke from Bronx, um, online, of course. And um, he has has a very, very long, like a, this bio is, is not brief by any, uh, and I'm going to just summarize his highlights. So he is a lab-based epidemiologist. He's currently investigating the role of human microbiome and cervical HPV, the natural history, and other STIs. So he has pioneered the characterization of cervical vaginal microbiome using NGS. And as you all know, this is a very hot area currently um, dominating the space of screening technologies and testing technologies. So it's going to be fascinating to hear about his work. He's also created an algorithm that takes NGS of uh, 165R RNA gene in clinical sample DNA and generates a nutrient-like bacterial vaginosa score, which is the uh, which is really interesting because it'll help us um, clinically interpret the data and also stratify patients. I would assume. Um, so he's an authority on the genomics and evolution of HPV. He was the first to report in any jam that the vast majority of HPV infections in young women are short-lived and don't require treatment. Dr. Burke is the past chair of the HPV nomenclature group of the ICTV, which is the International Committee for Taxonomy of Viruses, an elected fellow of AAS and has published only 450 papers. Welcome, Dr. Burke, and over to you. Okay, well, thank you. Hi, everybody, uh, since I can't see you. Uh, so I'm gonna go slow. Uh, I'm gonna try and uh, you know make a few points. And the points that I wanted to make were, uh, you know, the review the characteristics and talk a bit about the microbiome in general, since it's a new topic, um, I wanted to uh, discuss about developing a metric for the cervical vaginal microbiome, and that's what CVM stands for, uh, from 16S. I will explain all of this. Um, you know, this metric is basically going from normal to non-optimal. Uh, you know, how we've characterized the immune landscape of bacterial vaginosis. And then I'm going to move on to talk about some more practical aspects of understanding the cervical vaginal microbiome uh, as it relates to STIs, including papillomavirus and the most common chlamydia trichomonas. So, you know, an ambitious um, agenda, you know, will take one step at a time. And I hope, you know, we at least get through part one. Uh, so, the research that I do, and I'm predominantly in research is what I call translational research. And this ecosystem really requires a th at least three strong legs. It requires a clinical field effort. It requires epidemiology, biostatistics, laboratory effort, and often pathology. Without any of these legs, uh, it's really hard to accomplish this type of translational research. So let's get right into it. Uh, you know, we talk about the microbiome a little bit in general, but predominantly about the cervical vaginal microbiome. And, and I like to refer to whether you're taking a purely vaginal sample or a cervical sample like you would when you're getting a pap smear. I like to call it cervical vaginal because it's really, I think that it's one anatomic region uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, we haven't been able to separate them out. So a lot of human microbiome research relates to uh, the early human microbiome project that was funded by the NIH. And it was like, you know, it's amazing, it was over 10 years ago. And this was, uh, it, for me, it was a revolutionary meeting. It was predominantly run by computer scientists, sequencing jocks, some ecologists, some microbiologists, fewer clinicians, and yet fewer epidemiologists. And this really sets the stage for all of microbiome research. And, you know, and I would like to suggest, and in fact, that's to some degree why the field has the culture of computer science, because at that time, it was only computer scientists who could deal with the data. It was only the sequencing jocks who could get the data. Uh, you know, but now it's really, uh, really now, I would say the most important aspect is epidemiology and cl clinical medicine to try and understand what the impact is. Now, the field really came together through a convergence of technologies and research expertise. Uh, you know, many in, you know, paying attention or listening, you know, don't, you know, it wasn't trivial just to make oligonucleotides for PCR. 
Uh, you know, then there was the introduction of using a DNA barcode, but just as you go, when you go to the supermarket and they scan your cereal or your um, potato chips, uh, we can add a similar code to DNA during PCR. You know, the, the massive parallel sequencing, Illumina um, and other forms of uh, sequencing, the computer software to make the millions of reads uh, tangible and understandable, you know, putting it into a pipeline. This has come a long way. And then the translational science that puts it all together. So it's been a very exciting time to go through uh, this convergence of technologies and see the field maturing. So, but, you know, how do we think about, you know, the microbiome? So do we view it as a single entity, maybe like an organ, like the liver? Uh, do we view it as a collection of interacting things, like an ecological model? And, uh, or do we view it based on a single component, such as infectious disease, which we really have single um, organism uh, identification with specific areas. So, uh, you know, or maybe we do more than one way to think about it. But, you know, it, it, this, there is this emergence in medicine. And recent, you know, so how do we think about the microbiome? Uh, you know, and it's not a trivial, and as in medicine, nothing is simple. So, uh, you know, one of the things that attracted me to study the microbiome was this idea that each anatomic niche has a specific microbiome. And some of the first papers, no matter where you swipe, you did the nose, if you did the palms, if you did under the arms, you did the gut, you did the mouth. Each anatomic site has a unique uh, microbiome. <laughs> and I'm going to talk a little bit about that because I think that's a very important concept. Um, I, I think, to understand. And then, in fact, we now know that there's immune homo homeostasis that's developed with our microbiomes, usually resulting in stable core microbiomes. Obviously, there can be fluctuations. But, you know, we, we do like to think that as we develop, we, our immune system has developed uh, an ability to work with certain commensals. And so there's a stable core microbiome. And I think by and large, it's true. It's not true in every case. There are certainly variation, uh, you know, and this is important, you know, the time course of events, when we measure a microbiome, how long is that exposure uh, or that aspect good for, particularly in longitudinal studies? Obviously it doesn't affect, if you're in the clinic and you got a problem and you're measuring the microbiome with that um, disease issue. Uh, so, the ecological analysis are really what's been um, driving a lot of the microbiome work up to date. And, you know, anybody that studied ecology in college, the way ecologists work, they would go to the forest, they would, they would wall off a little area, they would count the leaves, the, the worms, the, the, the squirrels, um, you know, and, and they would do this over time. And then they would they develop metrics on how they describe the ecological. Uh, environment which they have mapped out. And, and, and that's like this alpha diversity. This is within a SIP, like how many squirrels, how many acorns, how many worms do you have within it? The beta diversity really talks about the difference between different plots. You know, it could be in the same forest, could be different forests. And then there's these computer methods or analytical methods uh, that we use to actually look for statistical significance uh, there's, you know, Unifrac, which, uh, you know, uses the phylogenetic measure. And, and the importance of that, if it might not seem obvious, so if, you know, you have two organisms which are completely unrelated, well, they have a different weight than two things that are closely related, um, uh, you know, in their biological effect. So that's where this, you know, phylogenetic constant kind of comes in. And, the, you know, common methods of principal coordinate analysis, principal, uh, you know, PCA analyses, you know, ANOVA, we're looking at between versus within, and PERMANOVA, you know, using um, different permutations to do the statistical analysis. At the end of the day, we want to be able to ascertain uh, statistical significance. So, you know, getting right into, well, how, how do we actually assess the microbiome? It doesn't matter whether you're doing cervical vaginal, whether you're doing gut or oral cavity, uh, you know, skin, uh, you know, there's really at least three means of looking at it. So uh, 
a, a common method that has been derived is the 16S ribosomal RNA gene um, sequencing, that's amplicon sequencing. There's variable regions. Um, and this can give us an assessment of bacteria and archaea in a given sample. Uh, this does not really help for fungal or yeast or other eukaryotic type pathogens. For this, you need um, a separate uh, analysis, the ITS1 amplicon sequencing, uh, which we've been using. And uh, now the other thing in most microbiome communities, the uh, abundance of these two things will vary greatly. So, you know, certainly cervical vaginal is many, much more bacteria, archaea, mainly bacteria, than there are fungal yeast. Um, although in some cases, fungal yeast could take over. Uh, and then uh, these are what I would call the amplicon methods, which are straightforward, well worked out methods. And then we have a combined method, what we call shotgun metagenomics, where you just take the thing, you just make DNA or RNA, mainly DNA, and you just sequence, you just sequence the heck out of the thing so you can find everything. And the more you sequence, the more you'll find, you know, viruses, uh, plasmids, phage, et cetera. Because you can see these two previous methods or above will not give you uh, viruses. You know, viruses are difficult because there is no common uh, evolutionary origin uh, to viruses. Okay, so that's kind of the, you know, how we assess it. Now, I just want to say a little bit about these ecological methods and uh, because you see a lot about alpha diversity. And again, I said alpha diversity was a measure within a sample. So you can see the alpha, di you know, so this has three alpha diversity of three, right? There's three different things there. This alpha diversity of four, well, this has an alpha diversity of two. And what you can see is there's four things in all of these. Um, you know, this one has four different things. This has only two different things. Well, in analyses, we can also take into account richness and evenness uh, within a given sample. And, you know, the beta diversity is a difference between different groups. And you'll see a lot of this in the microbiome literature, and I will be talking a little bit about it later, or right now, okay. So if we just look at alpha diversity of the microbiome from three different anatomic regions, gut, oral, and cervical, uh, and this is from a study uh, we did, uh, you know, and what you can see is gut, uh, and this is diversity on the y-axis, the x-axis represents the site. So gut microbiome has a very high uh, alpha diversity. There's a lot of stuff going on. There are a lot of different bugs and yeast and all kinds of different things there. Oral cavities are pretty high, uh, but cervical is lower, right? I mean, it's a pretty simple cervical vaginal is a, um, is a much lower diverse group. Now, what I find really interesting is that think of, let's think about disease. Well, what happens in, when there's disease in the gut, you go from a high microbiome diversity to a low, say E. coli, um, you know, infectious, C. difficile, basically wipes out the normal organisms and the diversity drops really low. So that's disease in the gut. Well, what about the cervical vaginal region? It's exactly the opposite uh, in most cases. So where you, you take, you know, a, a pretty simple, uh, cervical microbiome, and then it becomes more diverse towards bacterial vaginosis, so that goes up, and that's disease. So depending upon the, the anatomic site, or what I like to call ecological niche, uh, the characteristics of the microbiome and organisms and disease can differ significantly in an opposite ways that might not be obvious, um, you know, until we really start thinking about it. Okay, so I mentioned this a little bit. Um, you know, this is using, uh, you can use these different methods. Uh, what I want to just say is that in the cervical, uh, in the cervical vaginal one, lactobacillus is the predominant, and the oral, the streptococcus, and then the anal or, or gut, provitella, and bacteroides. And, uh, you know, these are, you know, different organisms have adapted to different anatomic sites. Um, so now, Cervical vaginal microbiome, do we think about it as a continuous uh, ecological um, set of organisms, or do we see it as discrete? 
And what I mean is, I'll, I'll give you some examples because we're going to talk a lot about this. This is something I tend to think a lot about. Like, say, for bacterial vaginosis, is a basically continuous, right? There's different spores, and it's not like, um, you know, a complete discrete um, condition. It's, you know, uh, say, C. difficile that overwhelms uh, in the gut, but for bacterial vaginosis, it's a continuous score, and we set. A, uh, a threshold of what we would call diagnostic given certain symptoms, or is it discrete? You know, discrete are these community state types, uh, which does represent a state of the cervical vaginal microbiome. But I don't know, it, it's somewhat difficult how to integrate this in the clinical picture that we all see. So, or do they operate both? It's kind of like light. Light can be both particulate and wave like at the same time. So um, now, so how do the, let's just talk, we'll get to the methods. Uh, how is a cervical vaginal microbiome studied? Uh, so, you know, you collect a sample, uh, we extract DNA. If we're doing PCR with it, amplicon sequencing, we uh, put barcodes on the ends, we sequence it all, we amplify different samples, we mix them all together because they have different barcodes. Uh, we then take this next-gen sequencing of millions of reads, and this is where you need computer science or the algorithms, and then we split them up into uh, which reads came from which patients, and then we can look at the uh, taxonomic identification, and then we apply epidemiological methods. Uh, you know, this is becoming somewhat standard in the approach for amplicon sequence. Now, this is one of the first reports on the cervical vaginal microbiome, a Jacques Ravel, a very fine uh, distinguished investigator. And, and he proposed that when you uh, sequenced all the um, microbiomes, in what you found, this is from about 400 women, that if you do clustering, they somewhat form based on predominant organisms. And you know there was lactobacillus inners, Lactobacillus crispatus. Uh, you know there are multiple species of lactobacillus, um, and and he then characterized you know these community state types. Now what you can see is um, so group this line or row at the top here. You can see what he calls his community groups. They're predominantly based on a single organism, except group four, which is a polymicrobial. Uh, you know, and then you look at the Nugent score. Well, it's not that way. You know, it is clearly crispatus we know has very interesting properties. But outside of that, uh, it's not that clear in the relationship between the community state types and the Nugent score or the pH, uh, for example. Uh, you know, so, you know, this is classical data. You know, this was a, an important observation. And then you look below, you see the alpha diversity measures. And you can see that even amongst um, these different community states, there can be varying levels of alpha diversity. So maybe a little bit confusing, but clearly, you know, dominated by a single type or polymicrobial would be the way to interpret it. But clearly, thinking about the cervical vaginal microbiome as a discrete different states. Um, now, you know, I want to switch to just talking about bacterial vaginosis. Uh, and there's this very, very good article uh, in AIDS Research in Human Retroviruses uh, by McKinnon, where they really talk about, um, you know, molecular tests and how we describe bacterial vaginosis and, you know, talking about it as a non-optimal state, again, continuous versus discrete. And although uh, we might say that lactobacillus-dominated microbiomes are good, uh, it may be not good for everybody. It might not be the optimal type for everybody. And you know, I'm sure amongst the clinicians, you're very, you're very familiar with the way in the diagnosis. Uh, again, there's AMSL's criteria, you know, which three out of four would be uh, given a bacterial vaginosis diagnosis, um, you know, elevated pH, vaginal discharge, you know, the SWIFT test, and clue cells. Uh, alternative method 
is the Nugent score, which is somewhat like counting bacteria. Uh, it's, it's more tricky, requires, you know, a, a microscopist to really be able to do it. Uh, however, it's to some sense the gold standard. And again, it's been uh, a continuous score from zero to 10. And we put different cutoffs, you know, zero to three is negative, seven greater is uh, bacterial vaginase positive, And then there's this intermediate uh, measure. Uh, a very good article I would recommend if you want to know more about kind of the molecular uh, discussions of bacterial vaginosis, that would be good. But you know, so, and part of our work has been, well, you know, we have the opportunity for the cervical vaginal region to create a continuous score from what we would say um, is, you know, asymptomatic, I'll just say, to bacterial vaginosis. And this was uh, this study was uh, performed at the Mount Sinai um, uh, Adolescent, Co Adolescent Health Center in New York City. And you know, this is part of an ongoing NIH-funded study we have, particularly looking at um, outcome of papillomavirus vaccine. And so we uh, recruited about 60 women, and we wanted to use both criteria to de develop what we would consider the gold standard. So you know, women whose cervical vaginal microbiome was either clearly BV by both of the current criteria or were negative based on both of the criteria. Uh, we then use these 40 samples and uh, 16SV4 uh, RNA sequencing uh, to look at the both the, the genus level and the species level of the cervical vaginal microbiome. The V4 happens to have been shown to be a robust, simple assay for characterizing lactobacillus species. Um, you know, whereas not all of the amplicons give you the same thing. So V4 is a very robust system. Uh, you know, we've published this, and you know, based on this strategy, we were then, uh, you know, so let's look at the data. Uh, this is a heat map. Uh, we have as columns each individual patient and rho equals either the Nugent diagnosis or the AMCEL diagnosis or the different uh, bacterial species. And you can see uh, to cut some degree similar to uh, the Ravel paper. So this group is lactobacillus inners, but you can see it's spread out uh, across much of the uh, cohort. Uh, you know, Gardnerella, and then we have Crispatus. Crispatus, you know, I think it's very clear Crispatus uh, you know, often has few symptoms and other traits, uh, you know, whereas lactobacillus inners, uh, I, I think the jury is still out on lactobacillus inners. I think in some individuals, it has positive effects and in some individuals negatives. You know, Gardnerella is fairly common. And then you have these different other organisms. And I would say this half, the right half of the heat map is polymicrobial, and you can see that it's more associated with uh, the Nugent and Amcell diagnosis as BV, whereas the left half is, uh, you know, without, uh, you know, the BV diagnosis based on either Amcell or Nugent. Uh, so from this, we created this molecular BV, just, to, you know, we used, you know, a mathematical modeling, we used ratios, and this is just, if there's people that are interested in the bioinformatics, we explain it more in a recent publication. You know, data two is a way to process for allele sequence variants or amplicon sequence variants, um, which is now uh, what we use as a top level uh, analysis. And then we determine which organisms are associated with which ASV. Uh, we use ANCOM as a way to look at uh, specific organisms associated with a given outcome, uh, use reg robust regression, and then we tested it in three independent cohorts. So this score, MOLBV, allows us to go from next-gen sequencing of cervical vaginal microbiome sample to a Nugent score. Uh, and we were able to reproduce this uh, in three different populations, a U.S. population, and then two populations from Africa. And in both cases, we had, um, you know, AUC of, you know, above 0.8, you know, in the U.S. of 0.98 or 0.96 or 
and then here point eight. So very robust algorithm uh, where we had were able to test where we had microbiome read data and they had Nugent scores, allowing us to you know kind of uh, test the uh, to test the mold BV performance in different. Uh, ethnic and racial groups or ethnic or, you know, from different continents, you know, and thanks to Joanne uh, Passmore uh, for helping with providing some of these cohorts. So uh, at the end of the day, mole BV is just a molecular Nugent score. But, you know, the, from my perspective as physician, it allows us a way of thinking about the microbiome in a fashion that we're used to uh, as we think about bacterial vaginosis. And it creates a single metric that we can then use to look at how it influences other outcomes. And again, it can be assigned a clinical value, a clinical BV diagnosis. And we use the same uh, parameters that the standard Nugent score uses. Okay, so uh, the first study I want to um, talk about is a study that we did with National Cancer Institute in the Costa Rica vaccine trial. And what we were really interested in is how does the uh, cervical vaginal microbiome uh, influence the presence of a high-risk HPV infection? So uh, we didn't look at incidents in the study. We looked at whether uh, what happens to the infection, does it clear or does it progress? Um, and then we used a a match case control type study where we could look at follow-up in the cohort and the methods as I've discussed. Uh, now, uh, one of the things we were lucky in this condition, and that is many of us, uh, many people to study that bacterial vaginosis has an inflammatory component. And the study obtained cervical vaginal cytokines that we could look at their association uh, with a cervical vaginal microbiome. Uh, and we could then try and understand what's the kind of immune landscape in the cervical vaginal microbiome with bacterial vaginosis. And, uh, you know, we did this, uh, you know, we then used, uh, you know, computational methods and, and we had cytokine quantification where we could look at particularly the bacteria component. Uh, and this was just, uh, to review the type of study, it was, you know, this prospective method case control. You know, we had a reasonable number of individuals, uh, 273, that almost all of them had the second visit. And then there was progression in 33 SIN2+. Plus. Uh, you know, we were able to look at um, the characteristics of the microbiome and cytokines in the two visits. The outcome occurred after uh, the visit to about two and a half years later, okay? Uh, now, the first thing I would like to point out is that we looked at each cytokine individually, uh, how they were correlated with molecular uh, BV state, positive, uh, you know, intermediate or negative. You know, we, we create a continuous scale and you can see that uh, IP10 um, looked like it had a protective role Whereas, you know, on the side, on the side to the right, uh, this is the odds ratio below, uh, IL-1B was most associated with bacterial vaginosis, you know, and then TNF and these others uh, were also um, associated. Now, I'm not going to show you, we use ratios, I'm not going to go through all the analytical um, acrobatics that we did in the study, it's all, this has been published um, but when we looked at uh, mole BV uh, and we looked at this ratio of IL1B to IP10, now this is pretty interesting. Uh, so if you, you can see that the as we go from BV negative women to BV intermediate to BV positive, there's a really, you know, the off the wall chart of p-value significant of this IL1B over IP10. Nevertheless, there were individuals that had clear BV that had normal levels of this ratio, IL1B to IP10, um, you know, compared to the BV negative group. So, you know, and it was curious, why would a woman who considered BV positive have, um, you know, this not have an inflammatory response? So we then 
we went and we looked at this group specifically, and what we were able to show is that they had um, not IL-1B over IP10 elevation, but they had a TNF regular, they had a TNF modified um, inflammatory response. So uh, the point of this is that in, amongst women with bacterial vaginosis determined by this molecular test, MOLBV, uh, there seems to be at least two forms of inflammatory response. One is the IL-1B over IP10. The other is the TNF-alpha uh, response. Uh, so, uh, you know, we could then look at these responses for biological activity. So, again, just to restate, molecular BV is associated strongly with inflammation. I think everybody knows that. Uh, and the two signatures that we saw as the dominance were this IL-1B over IP10 and TNF-alpha over MIP-1B. So uh, now, how does either bacterial vaginosis or these immune uh, regulatory molecules, these cytokines, affect the HPV natural history? Um, now, so now we switch a little bit to talk about HPV. Uh, you know, it's the predominant risk for papilloma, cervical papillomavirus is the development of cervical cancer. You know, certainly 100 years ago was the number one cancer killing women. We've made progress, but not enough. It's still a common cancer in too many parts of the world. Uh, you know, we have the means to stop it. Nevertheless, it's still a problem that as clinicians we have to worry about. Uh, and the mixture of how pathogen, in this case could be HPV, could be some other organisms such as chlamydia, the host, uh, and the microbiome interact um, in some ways to cause disease. Remember, uh, you know, if, you, if, if there was no disease, there wouldn't be the same concern uh, about, you know, the high-risk papillomaviruses infection and trying to understand the factors that influence how a high-risk HPV goes on to develop a cancer and actually kill women, uh, you know, at a relatively young age. Uh, so just a few words about papillomavirus, you know, obviously sexually transmitted infection, uh, a lot of types, over 200 types of human papillomaviruses, relatively small genomes. However, only 13 are really associated with cancer. Uh, they infect predominantly epithelial cells, you know, focusing predominantly on the cervical, uh, uh, cervical HPV for this talk. Uh, but also cause oral pharyngeal, anal cancer, uh, vulval cancer. Um, you know, in, in over 10, 15, 15 years, approximately 15 years ago, Harold Zurhel was given the Nobel Prize for his seminal contribution in pointing this out. Um, and again, so HPV 16, everywhere in the world, it's, a, it's at least 50% of the attributable proportion for cervix cancer, 18 is also pretty high, but then it varies. You know, and one of the reasons HPV 35 was not in the current vaccine uh, was because when they did the world survey, they undersampled Africa where HPV 35 is much more common. Uh, I think they're trying to make amends to uh, the nine valent vaccine so they'll have some inclusion of 35. So different regions of the world can have different spectra of HPV, but almost all the regions throughout the world, 16 is the dot, 16 is the gorilla in the room. And you can see in a case control study uh, published a number of years ago, odds ratio of 434, that's like off the charts. I mean, papillomavirus are so carcinogenic and particularly 16 is a really bad player, um, you know, that we really want to prevent. So, uh, you know, the, the vaccine can do that uh, but we're talking about, you know, individual might have missed the vaccine, et cetera. But, you know, so let's now go back to the natural history of HPV infection. Uh, you know, as you go from infection to cancer, this is now a viral centric model. You know, the, given, you know, sexually active people are going to get exposed to HPV. You know, as we showed in New England Journal of Medicine years ago, most of it clears, most of it doesn't need to be treated. You know, I don't know, somewhere around 5% after a year will still be present. Um, uh, you know, some of this can progress. Uh, it's about of persistent infection uh, that has 
pre-cancer, about 10 to 20 percent will go on to cancer. Uh, but it's a minority of, if you start here, it's a way, it's a little minority of HPV that actually goes on to cancer. So it's not, you know, it's not just HPV 16 infection that causes cancer. There are other risk factors and conditions. Uh, and this is why consideration of uh, the microbiome is important. So, uh, you know, again, so this is now looking at it vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the cyt cytological aspects from a normal, uh, you know, to a transient infection, and you get kind of persistent, you got these abnormal, um, you know, epithelial looking cells, and this is a frank cancer, uh, you know, and there is this progression uh, that we can see both at the at the cell level um, when we look at it. But again, most of the papillomavirus res resolves itself, uh, even at the precancer stage. Um, some of it, you know, not all of it goes on to uh, progress. Now, uh, you know, something that's not mentioned much is well, where actually does the cervix cancer occur? And the, the ecological niche of cervical cancer is called the squamous columnar junction, also known as a transformation zone. Um, and over 90% of cervix cancer causes here. Uh, it's thought that if the, if the cancer derives from these columnar cells, it, it it's presents itself as an adeno cancer, adeno squamous. Most of the cancer, however, uh, resolves over here or resides here, and it's a squamous cell cancer. Um, and, you know, but there is, a, you know, there is ecological uh, region, and you know, this is the uh, the uterus. Uh, you know, this is the vagina down here. When you go up, it's the endometrium. So, uh, you know, most of the cervix cancer develops at the squamous columnar junction. So, uh, the samples that we've taken uh, or that we've used are predominantly from the cervix. Although, as I say, I like to just consider all cervical vaginal samples, whether they be from the cervix or vag vagina, as cervical vaginal. And this is now looking at um, mole BV. It's the women that had persistent bacterial vaginosis um, versus those that didn't. It's very clear that the women that had persistent bacterial vaginosis were slower to clear a, a papillomavirus infection in those that didn't have this. So clearly uh, bacterial vaginosis was associated with clearance of a um, papillomavirus infection. Now, when we looked at just using the cytokines as a measure, we saw even the better separation with the IL-1B, IP-10 ratio. And again, uh, those that had high levels were slower to clear than those that had um, you know, excuse me, the, the ones that had high level were in red, they were slower to clear the infection. Those that had sustained low levels for the comparison group, you know, they cleared much more rapidly. So, and, and this is published data. Uh, and lastly, when we did a full model analysis of BB and inflammation after adjustments, et cetera, uh, the, the, uh, the cervical, bat, the inflammation appeared to be the strongest predictor of high risk clearance about you know, women that had um, persistent uh, uh, cytokine levels were almost twice as likely not to clear their infection. However, having low levels uh, of molecular BV increase the likely to more quickly clearing, as I mentioned before. So either having low levels of the cytokine or having low levels of molecular BV uh, were associated with a better outcome. And progression uh, what we were able to show, and to me, this was really quite amazing in a, um, a logistic regression model. What we showed was that those women that progressed were more likely to have had the TNF alpha. So the women with TNF alpha were almost threefold more likely to progress than those uh, based on either just a mole BV or the other cytokine pattern. So, you know, two different cytokine patterns. One was associated with uh, natural history of the infection, another with progression. You know, and we know TNF alpha has effects on epithelial cells um, that might explain some of the mechanisms. Okay, so, uh, so I've told you a story about the cervical vaginal microbiome, how we analyze uh, for a continuous way, whether there is bacterial vaginosis, 
uh, as a scale and its influence on HPV. Now I want to turn uh, in the remaining few minutes to uh, look at the risk of incident chlamydia infection. And we wanted to ask the question whether women that did not have chlamydia but were, were sexually active uh, did bacterial vaginosis or how did their cervical vaginal microbiome influence the acquisition of CT? Uh, since uh, essentially all these women would be treated, this is not really the untreated natural history study, this better focused on the ability to acquire a chlamydia infection. Uh, and then again, this was not to go through the papers under review, so the data is not published yet. Again, the prospective study, we had three visits, one before the visit, one at the time of the chlamydia infection was detected when we matched to controls, women that had been in the study as long, were sexually active, but didn't have chlamydia. And then we did this uh, post-treatment visit, uh, you know, particularly for the chlamydia uh, cases, the women uh, with controls obviously weren't treated and they just uh, were followed for the, uh, you know, as a follow-up time period. Uh, and we basically wanted to look at the role of the cervical vaginal microbiome. So uh, I have to tell you all, you all, um, our experience and, under, and know about chlamydia trachomanus, it's highly prevalent, it possesses a, you know, a significant public health burden. Uh, it, you know, it, it's a disease of predominantly young sexually active women, it's the most commonly reported bacterial STI, and there's a large public health burden and a potential for long-term health consequences, uh, PID, infertility, et cetera. Um, and it's, there are disparities in disease. Uh, black individuals are disproportionately affected. Uh, you know, in some studies, over five times that of white women. Uh, and you know, there's, uh, you know, the study that we uh, are using has a predominance of black and Hispanic women representing uh, uh, the city population that frequents the Mount Sinai Adolescent Health Center. Uh, you know, now there had been cross-sectional studies showing an association of chlamydia with bacterial vaginosis. Um, however, there's not, there has not been that many studies that are really prospective that can really, you know, dig into the weeds here on what might be, what might be specific risk factors given uh, multiple sex partners uh, in different groups. So uh, this is the, just a brief view of the demographic. It was two to one matching uh, controls to cases. And when we just looked at the, this is at the um, the, di the diagnostic visit, you know, T0, uh, you can see that uh, BV was highly associated with uh, the CT case status um, versus, uh, you know, BV negative. And it was highly statistically significant. Um, now, uh, we did look at uh, molecular BV with CT both prospective and cross-sectional. So uh, let me just go through. This is now uh, BV scores, molecular BV scores. This is the visit before chlamydia. This is the visit at chlamydia. And this is the visit after treatment for chlamydia. And what we have prior to the development of chlamydia, you can see that the women in red who were going to develop chlamydia had higher uh, mole BV scores than those women which were controls. At the time of CT, you can see that uh, there is a strong association with chlamydia and molecular bacterial vaginosis uh, of the women that have chlamydia versus controls. And subsequent to treatment, they look, they're pretty close. I mean, the, this abnormal um, bacterial vaginosis score goes, you know, drops considerably in the women who were treated, which is a good sign. Um, now, you know, this is, I mentioned this before, this was this continuous, this is the discrete way of looking at the cervical vaginal microbiome. Well, we also looked at uh, community state types. Now, community state types, um, when you look at the community state types, by molecular BV, what we for there's two different forms of um, community state types that were associated with bacterial vaginosis in this cohort. Um, whereas, okay, so the one that has inners, they're kind of intermediate, uh, not much going on, but there is clearly two different forms 
of bacterial vaginosis. One had this CST4A, which had this BBAB1, and then one, uh, this other one, this other form, BBABB, had um, uh, the A vaginae uh, as the predominant organism in the community state time. And both were highly associated with bacterial vaginosis. So uh, we wanted to look at these two different states and the risk for development or acquisition of chlamydia. Uh, and to make a long story short, what we could show was that the uh, form that had BVAB1 was, and that's this Moby V BVA group, um, was over two and a half times more at risk to develop chlamydia um, than any of the other groups compared to the Moby V negative. And, uh, you know, it's a bit complicated. But I just wanted to point out that this stratification of bacterial vaginosis by the CST produced even greater results uh, for risk. Um, and again, uh, when we look at BVAB1, uh, we could show that BVAB1 uh, in the context of a high uh, cervical vaginal microbiome BV score was, as I mentioned before, highly associated with chlamydia acquisition. So this presents a potential target uh, for understanding the association between bacterial vaginosis and development of chlamydia. So I'm almost done. Uh, so just to summarize that the mole BV bacterial vaginosis was strongly correlated uh, with established measures of bacterial vaginosis that everybody's familiar with, Nugent AMSO. Uh, the mole BV uh, bacterial vaginosis was associated with two different types of local inflammatory responses. Um, one was associated with high-risk HPV clearance. The other was associated with progression. Um, again, this might not apply to all the populations, not all cytokines remain. You know, so there are certain limitations. Uh, you know, studies need to be repeat, reproduced. Um, continue that, you know, characterizing the entirety of uh, chlamydia trachomatis natural history from uh, prior to post. Uh, you know, this is one of the things the study did. You know, the CT cases were nearly four times more likely to have BV at the time of diagnosis, and prospective samples indicated that the BV increases the risk of acquisition of CT, uh, and it appeared to, uh, you know, this one organism within the bacterial vaginosis community, this BVAB1, strongly raises the CT risk. Uh, so potentially, you know, and then treatment of partially recovers the optimal CVM state, as I showed in the visit post-treatment in the women that had uh, chlamydia and bacterial vaginosis. Uh, you know, but we still need, uh, you know, this needs uh, more time in reproduction. Now, uh, you know, if you have, uh, you know, done bacterial vaginosis or you've done um, 16S sequencing, you, you can turn that into a bacterial vaginosis um, score. You know, we've deposited uh, the algorithm. You know, actually, uh, Eduardo Franco's group has used it. You know, if there's a problem, we can help you. There's also an R package. Uh, so this is available for the community. Uh, you know, this thanks to Mike Usik in my lab, who, uh, you know, is kind of the senior bioinformatics person who's leading a lot of the analysis. He's now getting a PhD in epidemiology. Our colleagues at the Mount Sinai and Lesson Health Center, Andrew Diaz, Nicholas Schlesch, originally from uh, Canada, McGill, um, you know, my lab, and then others at the CVT NIH study, Amy Kramer, and others. And then we've been fortunate to have um, uh, NIH support for this. And here's my lab at one point uh, prior to the pandemic when we were going out to listen to some music. And I will stop here and take any questions. Fascinating, Dr. Burke. I learned a lot. Um, I have one question from uh, Dr. Franco. It, uh, he says it would be nice to test the hypothesis uh, that the IL-1B, um, 1P10 ratio, it may be a local response uh, to restore the CVM to its core state. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, it, it's tricky measuring the cytokines in the cervical vaginal. These are measuring cervical vaginal mucus. So, 
you know, these are tricky assays. It's not, they're, they're not nearly as robust as measuring the DNA. But I think, you know, I mean, I think these are, that's a great thought. Great idea. And there's one more from Rebecca Brotman on the association between mall BV, um, BV ratio and HPV persistence. How frequently are those cervical samples assessed over the year? Um, I ask because uh, small but frequently sampled studies several times per week reflect HPV fluctuating above and below the level of detection quite frequently. So what is the best way we should be measuring HPV clearance? Well, so, you know, we measure it by PCR. And I, I think HPV, it's not like falling off a log because of the heterogeneity of HPV. And again, there's commercial assays. There's, you know, that, that's a whole separate discussion on the best ways of measuring it. But no test is 100%. You know, but um, HPV does, you know, for low levels, you know, as a PCR test, low levels fluctuate much more than high levels. So when if, it's, if, if, if they're lower levels, Absolutely, they fluctuate. It's hard to get reproducibility amongst different labs, you know. It, it, but most of these were pretty high-level infections. So, uh, you know, it's it, it's just a problem in the assays and the experience of the laboratory. Any more questions? Please type in or ask questions. Sorry, Nikki, there's a question in the Q&A box. Um, I'm not sure if you can see it, but if not, I'd be more than happy to read it. Please okay. do. For studies Sorry. where researchers have 16S of shotgun metagenomic, how do they calculate the mole BV score? Is there a publicly available package? Okay, what tax and micro characteristics have strongest predictive power for a high? Yes, yeah, yes, it is available. Um, you know, if you go to our paper, there is, you know, you can either contact our lab for the R package, or there was in GitHub, uh, you know, it was deposited, uh, you know, so it's absolutely available, um, you know, for analysis. Now, uh, it is true that for, you know, that not all the databases are equal. There have been issues with the database to be able to detect it, but we direct you in the GitHub, you know, to the database, I believe that we use, you know, that had to be supplemented to some of the species level uh, 16S regions for a uh, lactobacillus. That's all we have. We don't, do we have any more questions, audience? We would love to ask Dr. Burke while we have it. But nobody asked me what this picture is. <sighs> this is, is black. This Canada? This this is no. Well, this is it, it could be Canada. Uh, this is it's called Black Lake, and it's east of the Cascades in the state of Washington. So Why it's the it place to go. The, the place to go when the Cascades are snowed in. Why is it called the Black Lake? Uh, it, it looks kind of black, doesn't it? It's yeah. because it's it has this like black looking appearance. Uh, yeah. There's also there's a for, for, fire spread. They're a very beautiful spot. Um, yeah. So that's all that we have. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Burke. For me, it was a very, very, very insightful and extremely useful presentation. I would always keep this in mind when I do my big picture epi work. So thank you. It was very useful. But I have a, I have a question about your vision. Like, how do you expect like this small baby score to be used? Do you want everybody to um, use it and like what, where do you go from here with your score? Well, so it, it's basically a research score. I, I'm not yeah. suggesting that, you know, that this is going to become a commercial time. I'm saying that certainly in the, in the cervix cancer community where we have stored DNA or stored samples, we can, mm -hmm. re, you know, we can recreate a bacterial vaginosis score and look at its influence on other STIs and other you know, features of HPV infection, you know, and that, that's kind of what we're doing. So, you know, I mean, it, it, it's a specifically tailored test, you know, it's with Amplicon sequencing, it's pretty easy. So th that's the vision of how to, you know, how to use this for, you know, particularly, you know, there's so much 16S and it's hard to, you know, I mean, the, the categorical data is the, the community state types is correct. 
but it's hard to integrate that. You know, if you're doing an epidemiological study and you have five different states, you've reduced your power, you've reduced your analytical potential. Whereas if you have a con one continuous score, you know, it's, it's, it facilitates it. And I think clinicians, you know, it, we have a way of uh, kind of appreciating that in clinical medicine. Mm -hmm. There's another question from Talia. So the interaction between community state types and mall BV is an interesting area for more research. Yes. <laughs> I mean, so one of the problems with a BVAP1 is it has like three or four different names. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, it, it's, it, groups might have had it, you know, it was called shuttle worthy. It was called, you know, it, it now is called, it has a, a candidate name, the Jock, um, Jock Ravel's lab. Rebecca, and she could maybe, um, uh, you know, comment on, I think, lactose, viridia, I have a bad memory, so, but it's, you know, so the problem is you take an organism which could have significant pathogenicity, there it is, uh, lacnocurva vaginae, oh, that was close, um, so, uh, you know, you take a, a bacteria, that, but not everybody has found it, not everybody's reported it, because it wasn't in the database. So, you know, the database that we use for microbiome analysis are really important. You know, whether it be the cervical vaginal region or whether it be the gut. It would be interesting to explore contextual level variables with small baby score to figure out what the patterns are, you know, in different parts of the world. I think that would be a good question. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, you, you could, you know, and the issue is that, uh, as we all know, this bacterial vaginosis states are, um, a lot of it's asymptomatic. So, uh, you know, if an individual is not complaining, they can still have different types of, but I'll just say different different community types or, you know, mole BV, BV scores, et cetera. So you have to actually measure it to look at the influence on outcomes. You could argue that the concept could be applied to other um, ecosystems. Microbiome yes, ecosystems. yeah, yeah. You know, we've been we've been trying to do this for the gut. I mean, gut, it's really hard. There is no, con you know, it's hard to find a continuous or it, the one of the goals of the microbiome work is to try. You know, how do we describe the microbiome as a community? You know, mm -hmm. basic. You know, you, we think about it. Okay, if there's, you know. Pathogen, if there's gonorrhea, you know, after, you know, with syphilis, maybe it's not a good example, but, you know, certainly gonorrhea is a micro, you know, is an ecological niche specific infection um, mm -hmm. or chlamydia, you know, and uh, that we understand, but, you know, but for any ecological system, you know, to come up with a single measure, you know, maybe it's possible or maybe it's not, but certainly for the cervical vaginal region, I think we do have. Uh, you know, you know, a potential way to think about it on the continuous scale. Uh, you know, but you know, I think it's both. You know, when you think about light, right? It's both particulate and wave-like. So I think that it's both continuous and it's discrete. Like variables. Can I ask for a clarifying question to my last question? This is from Rebecca Brotman. Yeah. Um, when you look at HPV clearance, do you look at HPV by PCR every few months? Or when we look at twice weekly in a very small study, we saw PCR popping above and below detection. I'm asking how many samples do you need in a research setting to determine HPV clearance? Good question. Yeah, I, I mean, so, you know, to be honest, we've looked at HPV with the samples that we have there approximately every six months to a year in the CVT study, because that's what they, you know, they just of cost effects and study design, uh, you know, but HPV is tricky. If you're doing it in a research laboratory, it is a tricky test that people underestimate the complexity. Um, anyway, I'm happy to help you if you want to contact me directly. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Burke, for taking okay. the time out and giving such an insightful seminar today. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.